January 10th, 2024. It has been 25 years to the day since the pilot of the greatest television show ever aired in 1999. I've spent the last few months researching some of the most complex and obscure fan theories out there, using this JPEG as a guide, and I'm happy to finally get this out there to share with you all. At the risk of yapping worse than six barbers, I'll just cut to the chase. Enjoy the show. In the Czech Republic too, we love pork. Ever had our sausages? Come here! Come here, they're trying to fly! Ugh. Come here, the babies, they're trying to fly! Look, they're trying to fly! Ducks are shown prominently throughout the course of the show, at least predominantly during the first couple of seasons. While what the ducks mean for Tony is ultimately open to interpretation, I think most would agree that at a base level, Tony is enamored with their innocence and natural predisposition to stick together as a family, without all of the BS and violence human beings constantly inflict on one another. Throughout the show, Tony constantly complains about his upbringing, particularly throwing his mom under the bus, and often echoing the notion that he did not choose a mob life, but that it and all of the violence and immorality chose him. So the ducks symbolize some kind of escape or fantasy for Tony. Which, in my opinion, is sort of also the manifestation of the character known as Kevin Finnerty too, later on, during Tony's coma dream. Side note, gotta love the hypocrisy of Tony, who loves ducks, yet signs off on asbestos being poured into their environment. Hypocrisy is a huge, if not the biggest theme of The Sopranos, a theme in which I'll be alluding to often in this video. You wanna know what I'm thinking? Seriously? I'm thinking I'd like to take a brick and smash your f***ing face in a f***ing hamburger. This bit on the iceberg suggests that the show The Sopranos is much more than your typical crime drama. Indeed, the show does tackle extremely dark truths of morality, mortality, hard truths on life, relationships, betrayals, etc. While conveying all of these deeply serious and often troubling truths, somehow also finding a way to make us laugh all the while with some quip or punchline, so as to keep things at a baseline charm. They are not going anywhere! I'd rather smother them with a pillow than take them to Nevada! Always with the drama! The Many Saints of Newark is the 2021 prequel film to the hit show, which takes place roughly 30 years prior to the events of The Sopranos. The film's central protagonist is Christopher's late father, Dickie Moltisanti, who is mentioned several times during the show The Sopranos. Basically, all characters who appear in The Sopranos appear in this film in some capacity. While the film has received mixed reception at best, it, at worst, is the first and only extension of the universe since the show ended in June of 2007. With this film breaking the 14-year drought, it does make you wonder if we might see another follow-up film or TV series in the future. You need another kid like you need a f***ing hole in the head. What are you doing? Put that back. Oh, fine. So you think I should get an abortion? But Ralphie is the father, you'll be doing this kid the next two generations a favor. You'll recall Tracy as one of Ralph Cifaretto's girlfriends, who appears in just a couple of episodes of the show. Tracy was a stripper who worked at the Bing, and one night, Ralph beats her to death behind the Bing, which is especially awful because in addition to being really young, possibly as young as 18, uh, she was also pregnant with their baby. Of course, this despicable act likely did aid in Tony's decision to kill Ralph, who of course was a made guy, who are supposed to be untouchable. While murdering Ralph, Tony says the following. She was a beautiful, innocent creature. This bit on the iceberg suggests that Tony's referring to Tracy as a beautiful, innocent creature while pummeling Ralph to death. What's your favorite scene? I, I can't have this conversation again. When Vito goes back to Sicily, the crickets, the great old house. Oh, it's beautiful. The show is considered by most to be the greatest show in television history. Tony Soprano is considered the original and greatest anti-hero of modern television. Without Tony Soprano, Shows like Breaking Bad or Boardwalk Empire would probably cease to be. Also, the show really put New Jersey and the American-Italian stereotype on the map, likely also promoting the pop culture success of the hit MTV show Jersey Shore, which began two years after the finale of The Sopranos aired. The actor who plays Polly Walnuts in The Sopranos, Tony Sirico, actually appeared in a really bad Jersey Shore TV movie back in 2012 that you probably never heard of, and you probably never should hear of, so apologies in advance. Freezing out here. Don't you know better than to wear pajamas in the middle of winter? <laughs> <laughs> the 
the ex-commando from the critically acclaimed episode Pine Barrens is presumed dead, but never technically confirmed dead in the show. In 2008, David Chase said the following on the Russian's fate. Okay, this is what happened. Some Boy Scouts found the Russian, who had the telephone number to his boss, Slava, in his pocket. They called Slava, who took him to the hospital where he had brain surgery. Then Slava sent him back to Russia. So this would probably... So this was probably said in jest by David Chase, right? Um, on a separate occasion, Tony Sirico, who plays the character Polly, went on record in 2007 stating that Chase had written a scene to be included in an episode of season 6 wherein Chris and Polly would find the Russian outside of a random bar and promptly shoot him to death on sight. Sirico said that ultimately, David Chase didn't like it. He instead wanted the audience to suffer and never provide closure on the matter. The finale of The Sopranos, Made in America, was the second episode directed by David Chase, the first being the pilot of the show. The ending scene of the finale is indeed strange, and you can even argue that this five-minute scene could serve as its own self-contained movie. Guy walks into a diner, is over-aware of his surroundings, tries to chill and order some onion rings for his family, and this kind of appears to be a typical weeknight meal on the surface, but there's definitely this underlying dread behind everything. The camera often zeroes in on this guy in the members-only jacket, and eventually he enters the diner's restroom, precisely at Tony's 3 o'clock. And of course, this is a reference to that Godfather scene. While this is going on, we see his daughter attempt to parallel park a few times, until finally succeeding on the third try. The number three is a recurring theme on this show. It's also widely accepted that the final moment of the episode cuts to black, because this is Tony's last moment of consciousness, as he looks up at Meadow entering the diner, while getting clipped by the members-only gunman again at Tony's 3 o'clock. And this takes us to our next subject. So, how can we be sure that Tony was clipped? Well, there are many ways in which the writers of the show have built up to this moment leading up to it. To name a few, uh, number one, New Jersey and New York are at war with one another in this final season. As is made abundantly clear, Tony and crew put out a couple of attempts on Phil Leotardo's life. The first, while unsuccessful, did not fall on deaf ears. The second hit was a success, and in fact takes place during the finale of the show. We also get a few glimpses of Phil and the New York crew having sit-downs together, in which they're constantly alluding to or outright spelling out that Tony is on their radar to get clipped. Number two, there's a scene that we'll touch on a bit later between Bacala and Tony, where Bobby sort of foreshadows Tony's demise, speculating with his brother-in-law, that you probably don't even hear it when it happens, or when you are murdered. If we go a step further and assume Bobby means executed via gunshot wound to the head, well then yeah, the final moment of the show is precisely what happens here. Tony is clipped. Brain matter all over the diner booth, and all over his son and wife. Uh, and just as a side note, there's an excellent video by Scenic Media that goes a step further and speculates that not only was Tony murdered, but even Carmela and AJ, due to a ton of what would otherwise be totally unnecessary symbolism of the number three during the five minute diner scene. He also argues Meadow witnesses all of this and survives, thus appearing 15 years later in that 2022 Chevy Silverado Super Bowl commercial where she encounters her brother as a ghost or specter. I know this sounds ridiculous, I know, but I really encourage you to give that video a shot before you roll your eyes, because his breakdown is actually more compelling than you would think. I mean, Chase was actually involved in shooting that commercial, which in my opinion lends credence to the whole thing, but I digress. And then finally, number three on why I believe Tony was clipped, is that generally in The Sopranos, a pretty common way in which they pan the camera as a creative slash directorial choice is often by filming Gandolfini's facial expression of something that's in front of him, followed immediately with a shot that's taken from Tony's literal point of view. If we assume this filming method is being used in the final frame, then panning back to Tony's point of view into a black void of nothingness assumes that he's gone. Hey, Tone. You know I've been working with the government, right, Tone? Don't say it. Anyway, four dollars a pound. If you were to ask Tony Soprano what he and his son have in common, he'd probably say something like, I'm supposed to get a vasectomy when this is my male heir? But they are in fact very similar. In therapy, 
Tony is frequently complaining to Melfi about his existential crisis. AJ has a stint in therapy too, but ultimately has a much more difficult time talking to others about his existential crisis. But they are more or less struggling with the same emotions, feeling isolated from others, questioning the point of it all, generally being incapable of, quote, just being happy, while others apparently have no issues conforming to a happy life. That Chinese kid. Your father never had the makings of a varsity athlete. What are you asking him for? He never even had the makings of a varsity athlete. Mother This is a quote that Corrado, Tony's uncle Jr., says in reference to Tony during moments of the show. Corrado has always been jealous of Tony's status as capo, or just the respect in general growing up. Uh, so to me, Jr. used his status as a father figure to degrade him in a way that comes off as passable because he's his uncle, and he knows Tony isn't going to murder him. He's hedging that Tony loves him too much from looking up to him for the majority of his life. We often see during the show what the consequences are when you barely even insult Tony. With that being said, not just Corrado, but we see Christopher get away with transgressions too that just wouldn't fly if it came from a non-family member. You don't do something, I gotta question your leadership. Hello. Listen, Tom, we're really lost. We've been walking around for hours. I lost my shoe. We found some old truck. When I meet people in my personal life and ask them what their favorite episode is, the answer is almost unanimously Season 3, Episode 11, entitled Pine Barrens. This episode is the one where Tony sends Chrissy and Polly out to the Pine Barren Woods in New Jersey to execute the Russian character, Valerie. They fail miserably at accomplishing this. Parallel to that main plot of the episode, Tony and Gloria's toxic relationship is on the decline, which has its own fair share of humor, but is mostly extremely dark subject matter. It is arguably the quintessential Sopranos episode, as it demonstrates how truly world-class world the Sopranos pulled off dark comedy. I don't know. My mother. You told him about your father, right? Who? Your therapist? Yeah. Yeah, I told him. I'm good. As a capo of his time, and as we can see with Tony's own life, it's clear that the capo lifestyle for Johnny did not lend itself to fostering a strong family dynamic. I mean, he used to whack us kids around a little bit. The belt was his uh, favorite child development tool. This is a survivor show. Somebody should find the winner, stick a pistol in the face, and say, you're not gonna survive this unless you Ooh. give me 25%. In season three, episode two, Bop and Sarah's ghost can be seen in the liquor cabinet mirror as Furio is pitching the idea of robbing the winner of Survivor with Polly. Before and after plotting the deaths of Pussy was over with, there are many moments in the show in which depict Tony having difficulty coming to grips with the reality of killing his longtime friend. Additionally, this instance is one of several on the show which can be interpreted as evidence that the supernatural exists in the universe. But more on that later. Smile you. Said for my father. All right, but you gotta get over it. Not sure what the iceberg means here by subtle, but there are many instances in the show where Tony appears to be void of empathy. One scene that particularly comes to mind for me immediately is during a therapy session with Melfi, in which he brags to her about effing Irina, citing her young age and coming off completely unhinged in the process, or when Furio is crying to Tony about his air quote father passing away, and Tony immediately tells him to get over it, and then of course followed by the scene immediately afterwards where Tony is bawling his eyes out in a therapy session with Melfi. Or when he promises to Vito's widow and family to help financially, but then proceeds to go on his worst gambling binge of his life with that money, rendering himself incapable of helping anymore. If you get sick or something happens and you can't earn, we'll take care of you, because that's part of it. The man who shot Tony Soprano in the final episode was wearing a jacket that read on the back, Members Only. Members Only is the name of the first episode of the final season. Maybe a coincidence and more to this one, maybe not. For example, in that Members Only episode, this is where Gene, a loyal member of the DeMeo family for many years, takes his own life due to Tony's refusal of allowing him to oblige his wife and move to Florida. There are fan series that suggest a close party to Gene helped orchestrate Tony's execution and revenge, thus the jacket being labeled after the episode. Members only, generally, is defined as denoting a club or a society exclusive to members. That scene during Tony's coma, where he sees his cousin Tony B inviting him to join the party, which we can infer is exclusive to the dead, i.e. members only. When Tony and Christopher ask Gene to um, execute that guy in the diner, it's actually um, a man 
with the initials uh, TS. Uh, the final show of The Sopranos, it's also a man in a diner with the initials TS, uh, who is, we can assume, murdered in the diner as well by a man wearing a members-only jacket. So this is absolutely not a coincidence. Um, and again, just, you know, to this day, the, the sheer depth to the writing in this show just continues to amaze me. For quite some time, Polly had been buddying up with members of the New York family, in addition to questioning Tony's decisions, which became more and more dangerous towards the end of the show. So, there is a compelling theory that Polly was the one who orchestrated the friendly fire deaths of Tony Soprano, wherein he would have been in cahoots with Phil, who may have promised aiding Polly in becoming top boss in New Jersey, or a chance to transition to a prominent role with New York. And of course, there's Polly's dream in which he sees Pussy in the kitchen, and says, when it's my time, tell me. Will I stand up? I think he's referring to the fact that Tony has made the decision in the past to murder members of the DeMeo crime family if it served his interests. And remember, these are made guys. You can't kill these guys if they're made. Well, Tony kind of ignores those rules, right? As we've seen. Here, Polly believes that Pussy can see the future given he is in the afterlife. So he is asking him if he will lie down and comply, letting Tony kill him, as Pussy did, or will he instead stand up for himself? There's also that theory that um, during one of the last moments on the show, uh, where Polly is having a sit down with Tony and Butch, and it's kind of a New Jersey, New York sit down, where obviously there's so much tension in the air, you can cut it with a knife. And we see that Tony is sitting in a very specifically different chair than everyone else. Like it's, it's, it's red, uh, and it contrasts every other chair. We see Polly. Uh, shaking hands with New York while Tony's back is turned. So kind of an interesting theory, and yeah, uh, Polly just may have, in fact, have had something to do with Tony's murder. Patsy, in addition to the Polly theory, is actually the number two suspect I most commonly see when researching top theories on who orchestrated Tony's death. Patsy's motive is probably the strongest on paper due to, of course, Tony taking his brother's life. Patsy is also the closest to a main character on The Sopranos that we see attempting to kill Tony at least once during the show, until eventually backing out during this scene. You're not mad, are you, Daddy? You're supposed oh, to be. I, do. I love you, Dad. I know. Not sure if the iceberg is referring to a supernatural element here, but I always did wonder how Meadow, Tony and Carmela's firstborn child, never succumbed to any of the common pitfalls of youth, and had such an innate instinct to do the right thing, despite having a fat fucking crook from New Jersey as a father. There are several instances where Meadow protects Tony from certain deaths, like when Meadow goes out to hang out with some friends and gets hammered drunk, and Tony is helping her into the motel room. Febby, who Tony kills at the end of the episode, makes an organized effort earlier in the day to kill Tony this evening. However, when Febby sees Tony with his daughter, he gets cold feet and decides not to go through with it. Secondly, in the episode Mayhem, during the tail end of Tony's coma dream, Tony is dangerously close to walking into the light, so to speak, but ultimately hears his daughter Meadow's voice as a young girl, which ultimately causes him to awake from the coma. And then thirdly, in the episode Another Toothpick, Meadow inadvertently gets rid of a lamp that the FBI had purposely planted into Tony's basement. This basement was commonly used by Tony as a safe space to discuss dirty business with guys like Polly, Bopincero, and several others. And then last but not least, perhaps the most compelling bit of evidence that suggests that Meadow is his guardian angel is that, during the final scene in Made of America, due to Meadow's failure to park in time to sit beside Tony in the diner booth, which was coincidentally adjacent to the Holston's bathroom, aka Tony's 3 o'clock, Meadow would have protected Tony physically from the members only jackets attack. Tragically though, she wasn't there in time. <laughs> what makes Soprano so captivating to me was always its ability to keep the audience engaged while leaving many events in the show open to one's interpretation. Ralph's character has characteristics of a psychopath 
a dumbass, a liar, and hints here and there of actual intelligence. Come on, I can be on time, but you'll be stupid forever. This bit on the iceberg suggests that the actor who plays Ralphie was never actually told who killed Pai and Mai. So in doing so, this actually spared the audience of being able to study the character's body language on the likeliest outcome. Though the leading theory, of course, is that it was Ralph who killed Pai and Mai, and of course this was something that David Chase openly admitted to during an episode of Talking Sopranos. Gino, what can I get you? Oh! It's all right, Doug. You let him go first. Gino is the name of the character in the donut shop with Christopher. This character only appears in this episode, but it is played by the same actor who would eventually play Vito. Little bit of a weird fourth wall plot holy thing that you'll catch the second time you rewatch The Sopranos, or first time if you're observant enough. Gino appears in season one, episode eight, The Legend of Tennessee Moltisanti, while Vito's first episode was not until season two, episode six, The Happy Wanderer, which is actually my favorite episode on The Sopranos. This was a Chevy commercial that aired during the Super Bowl last year in 2022. The ad features Meadow and AJ reprising their roles for the first time in roughly 15 years. As alluded to earlier, the Scenic Media YouTube channel analyzes this commercial in great detail to illustrate that the commercial is canon and confirms the notion that Meadow is alive and well, but that Tony, AJ, and Carmela were murdered 15 years ago to this day. I implore you to check that video out. Just to summarize a bit on what he calls out though, Meadow is wearing three different pieces of jewelry, each symbolizing a member of her family that's passed away with the black rectangle onyx being a reference to that controversial cut to black ending, or the end of Tony's consciousness. Two, AJ first appears in the commercial and is shot in the foreground, with a hearse in the background. Three, the way in which AJ is portrayed in this commercial sort of suggests that he's not real, but rather a ghostly manifestation to appear for this fleeting moment. The Scenic Media YouTube channel takes a step further to suggest that he is appearing for Meadow to once and for all move on from her grief, as she is pregnant and needs to move on. Here's why we can assume this. Number one, during the beginning of the commercial, where Meadow is driving from New York to New Jersey, it is a one-to-one -one identical opening from the Sopranos opening, except for one crucial detail. Tony passes a funeral, while Meadow passes a playground. This must suggest children in her future. Secondly, she is wearing an engagement ring. We can assume she is married to Patsy's son, or she has a new fling who isn't connected to the mafia at all. Again. Big shoutouts to Scenic Media on YouTube, link to his video in the description. To add to his analysis, there's also a shot that depicts Meadow totally nailing her park job against the curb. So is this a callback to her taking those three attempts from way back during, you know, the finale made in America? Let me know what you think in the comments. Most of us watch The Sopranos either streaming it on Max, or you may own a physical copy of the series. While the show was on air for those eight years, there are a few very interesting moments that were retaped or taped over due to concurrent events at the time, or even in the case of this scene, where um, I can't pronounce her name in real life, but it's basically the chick from uh, American History X, and she was actually the actress that first appeared as the FBI agent in season three before ultimately being replaced. Kind of like a lost history trivia. Anyway, after the tragic events of 9-11, HBO made the decision to remove the towers from the show's opening in perpetuity. Tony does mention the tragedy later in the series though, so we can infer from this that The Sopranos does in fact take place in our universe, and not some parallel one where the tragedy never took place. This is the body of Christ that was broken for you. I have read before that HBO may initially censored or at least contemplated censoring Tony murdering Febby when it first aired on February 7th, 1999. You have to remember, this was during a time when an anti-hero to the extent of Tony Soprano was pretty unheard of. Chase and crew were really innovating with pushing the envelope on how much they could get away with without coming off as tasteless. This was a huge risk and may have resulted in ratings tanking and possibly the abrupt end of the show as we know it. Fortunate for us, they continue to innovate and take risks. You don't consider yourself white? I don't mean white like Caucasian. I mean a white man, like our friend Cusimano. Now he's Italian, but he's a Menegan. It's what my old man would have called the Wonder Bread Wop. You know, he eats a Sunday gravy out of a jar. To me, the meaning of the title of the finale refers back to the post-ethnic world that Tony and Carmela belong to in raising a family in 21st century America. We often hear Tony romanticizing the past. 
namely the good old days during his father's time as number one, before all the neighborhoods lost their Italian identity, back when there was a real need for mothers to cook food for their families and stay at home, and back before therapy existed in the capacity that it exists today. If we were to break down a few of these examples in which Tony romanticizes the past compared to Tony's life during the show, we can identify Tony's issues with modern day society. On the neighborhood front, the old neighborhood lost its Italian footprint because as we all know, America is a melting pot. Gone are the days of first generation Italians existing in their own neighborhood. We see New York underboss Butch make this observation in the final episode where Little Italy is shrinking rapidly before his eyes. We also see Polly and Patsy lament about their Italian subculture losing prominence during different coffee shop scenes. As far as women cooking for their families goes, Carmela is a character who spent the majority of her adult life being a homemaker or succumbing to the traditional stereotype that women don't belong in the workplace and ought to stay at home like Livia and women before her did. Of course, too, is Carm. We see her grimace towards women who branch out from the stereotype and spread their own wings to earn a living, i.e. when Pussy's widowed wife buys a Corvette with her own money or even oftentimes being jealous of her own daughter, Meadow when she excels in areas that Carm never bothered to. And then last but not least, of course, the nature of how widespread therapy slash mental health has become in the 21st century. Tony spends a lot of time remarking to Melfi that he more or less feels the men of today are crybabies. But every now and then, it's revealed to Tony that men have always dealt with mental health. Hesh mentions to Tony that his dad, Johnny Boy, often suffered from the same passing out spells that Tony and even AJ also struggle with. So that was sort of a long rant. Thing is, the show is constantly depicting the melting pot post-ethnic nature of where the country is heading and how this affects Tony Soprano and his friends and family. To me, that's sort of where the finale of the show's title comes from. But let me know if you have a different take in the comments. And of course, there is a ton of hypocrisy in Tony constantly ridiculing the Wonder Bread WAP um, when we see Tony being guilty of the things that he accuses uh, Maragon of doing. So I wrapped the paper, and there she is. With her head held high and her ears perked What the fuck up. happened to Gary Cooper? That's, That's what I, I like smiling. to You realize by the time Caitlin's out of college, it'll be like the year 2027 20, or something? She takes after you. She won't be out of fourth grade by then. <laughs> of course, by that time, she'll be working here, so who gives a <laughs> 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 He was a good man, wasn't he, Phil? He was. I loved him like a brother-in-law. Leotardo appears to be homophobic to an extreme degree relative to other characters in the show, which is obviously saying a lot. Of course, Phil going through such extreme means to murder Vito does beg the question if he is projecting being closeted via the savage killing of Vito. Personally, I always found that Phil and Richie April's vehement homophobia may stem from their time in the can, perhaps both being victims of sexual abuse or rape. It is true that Phil is a survivor of one or several instances of rape. Perhaps he copes with his trauma by looking to punish Vito for his desire to engage with other men sexually. This might sound kind of ridiculous, uh, but let me know what you think in the comments. I mean, you know, perhaps Phil was jealous of Vito, since if Phil really was gay and sexually assaulted in prison and, you know, aroused by that kind of stuff, he likely will forever associate intercourse with men with being raped in prison. Thus, in Phil's warped reality, pledges to find Vito and then torture him to death. And we see kind of ways in which the show writers are kind of alluding to this, possibly, or just kind of poking fun at, you know, Phil in general just being really homophobic. Like that one time he he turns off the bodybuilding competition, which, why is that even on in the first place? It's kind of hilarious. You can't let your mind dwell on. Turn that off. Uh, and then two, you know, like I've mentioned earlier, he ambushes Vito and is emerging uh, in kind of like a dramatic fashion from the motel room closet, which obviously is a play on coming out of the closet. Um, <laughs> so make of all that information as you will. Will you please get dressed? You want to take it for a test drive? There are several instances on the show where we get glimpses into Tony's dreams. Here we see a wide range of Tony's hopes, dreams, and nightmares, ranging everywhere from his sexual fantasies with Melfi, on top of the fantasies 
we more often see glimpses of his fear of death or anxiety leading up to killing friends of his, most notably Big Pussy. He was a victim of his time. Uh, who cares? It's what he did. He discovered America is what he did. And in this house, Christopher Columbus is a hero. End of story. There is a large subset of Sopranos fans who lean conservative. I can't say this would surprise many, as I'm sure we all agree that the protagonist, Tony, would certainly identify as such. He often clashes with his son and daughter on political and social issues, who both lean more liberal over the course of the show. You're dragging me to hell! What? What's You're the matter? What's the matter? You're dragging me to hell! Polly, Polly! You had a nightmare, honey. Of any character in the show, Polly Walnuts is the only one who basically has his own subplot of constantly looking over his shoulder and obsessing over the paranormal. He is constantly waking up in a cold sweat from nightmares and has an unhealthy obsession with the 3 a.m. hour at night. Polly's mother is coincidentally a nun who disgraced her oath to God by getting knocked up and conceives Polly as a result, a fact which Polly wouldn't realize until the end of the show. Polly also has his run-ins with apparitions on the show, but more on that later. Grandma? There is a scene in an earlier episode where AJ feels Livia's presence in the house while he is home alone. He calls out her name and awaits an answer. The scene indeed has a strange, cursed aura to it. If Livia's ghost does inhabit the house, she would of course be a malevolent spirit and could be responsible for some of the troubles that would await her son Tony later in the series. Separately, in a scene later on in the series, while Bobby and Janice are having a dinner over candlelight, we see Janice's glass of wine move on its own. Now, I've rewatched The Sopranos probably over eight times in my lifetime, and I'm always dumbfounded when I discover yet another nod to the paranormal in this show. Whether this was Karen's or Livia's or someone else's spirit moving the glass, this is very much up for question. Yeah, I'd like to make a collect call. During the 60s and early 70s, Tony Sirico was a member of the Colombo crime family. He was active in neighborhoods in Brooklyn, Bass Beach, and Gravesend. Sirico was known for being tough, sometimes taking things from others, and driving for other gangsters now and then. He was arrested a total of 28 times during his life. In 1967, Sirico was sentenced to spend 13 months in prison for robbing a nightclub. Four years later, he was sent to jail again, but this time being given a four-year sentence, of which he only served 20 weeks before he was released. Things are good. Richie Aprile's in the Bermuda Triangle. All my enemies are smoked. <laughs> Unlike other crime dramas that this show is often compared to, The Sopranos does not have one main antagonist or villain. Prior to Nancy Marchand's death, who played Tony's mom, Livia, on the show, it was initially meant for Livia to have a major role well after her untimely death. Into season three, she was meant to testify against Tony in court, aiming to have her son thrown in prison. Of course, we experienced the show largely through the lens of Tony, who really was the first anti-hero ever in television, at least to succeed at this level and this scale. Personally, I would argue that if one needed to identify an antagonist of The Sopranos, it probably should be Tony himself. And when the last one goes, we become the old folks. What are you talking about? We're still f***ing kids, for crying out loud. Don't you believe it, Tony? When the last one dies, it signals the beginning of the last stretch for us. This was the name of a TV commercial released by the Yes Network, in which James Gandolfini appears. The message of the commercial, humor elements aside, is that life is short. Indeed, Gandolfini passed away shortly after this commercial aired, passing away at the age of 51 in Rome. It's commonplace for only a little over one quarter of television pitches to make it from the pilot stage into the series state. This is to say that most series pitches get nowhere. With that said, it's clear why there are usually plenty more production mistakes in TV pilots than there are later in a television series lifespan. The Sopranos pilot suffers from many common pilot mistakes, i.e. the fleet of film crew being visible in certain shots. However, I'll get into the more interesting ones from a character point of view. For one, Meadow is depicted much younger in the pilot. There are stuffed animals all over her bedroom. Secondly, Tony mispronounces Hannibal Lecter as Hannibal Lecture. Well, you think I was Hannibal Lecture before or something? Carmelo looks very different. Can't quite put my finger on this one. 
Something about her makeup, I think. And of course, James Gandolfini was by far the thinnest we see him appear in The Sopranos in this pilot. From this point on, he puts on a considerable amount of weight, probably to give himself a more physical presence to, you know, more strongly portray the Tony character. And as many fans are also well aware, uh, he obviously has a much thicker accent um, after this pilot. Also, Satriales goes by a different name. The cat in the back office of the Bing is hyperfixated with the portrait of Christopher in the last episode of The Sopranos. Some fans believe that the cat is Christopher's past lover, Adriana, reincarnated. There are indeed supernatural elements that manifest in this show, but there isn't much stronger evidence than the cat staring at the photo. Um, I guess also if you want to count that one moment in the episode hit as a hit where she's meowing. <laughs> Walden Casado in this scene says that the cat stares at the photo daily. There is definitely something intentional going on here with this, but just not sure that it's aid. Polly does explain to Tony that the picture has been moved multiple times, so it couldn't be that the cat is detecting like some rats behind the wall or something. Let me know in the comments how you attribute the significance of the cat, or if the cat is aid, or if the cat is something else, etc. Not in a bad rap. We become synonymous with dud. We hey, I know this guy. Failure, bust, fiasco. Anything defective is a lemon. The actor who plays Bobby recorded some audio for a few McDonald's commercials, where he reads his lines with a familiar delivery to that of his mafia persona in The Sopranos. He makes corny jokes like, People think I'm sour, but what can you expect when you consider my family tree? Commendator! <laughs> David Chase, at the time of recording, is a 77-year-old man. Shortly after The Sopranos ended in 07, the director of the series kept quiet about revealing concrete details to the public, and instead deferred to fans to speculate until the end of time on key what-ifs that the show never definitively spelled out in the show. However, in 2021, during an interview on the Many Saints of Newark film, Chase would forego his earlier stance on leaving show details open to interpretation, and strongly inferred that Tony was killed in that final season. This didn't really jive well with many fans of the show. Though, as a fun aside, during that same interview discussing Tony's death, Chase says around the year 0405, he had a different scene in mind to shoot. Tony drives back into the Lincoln Tunnel, goes for a meeting with Phil Leotardo, and he's killed. I don't think you were going to see the deaths, but you were going to know that he was dead. Oh, and he also revealed in a Talking Sopranos episode in 2021, that Ralphie did in fact kill Paiomai for the insurance money. Again, revealing details like this does ruin the ambiguity of one of the show's most discussed subject matters. Many fans of The Sopranos do go as far as to ignore Chase's remarks, since these are in such stark contrast to Chase's earlier philosophy and vision of the show's defining moments shining due to their intrinsic ambiguity. The next few bits of the iceberg, in addition to some later on, will cite recent remarks from Chase on the show, which takes us to the next subject. My poor baby. <laughs> My little boy. This bit on the iceberg suggests that, despite Ralph being a highly volatile and loose cannon, once he experiences the tragic deaths of his son, this would have marked the beginning of a new, less ethically bankrupt Ralph Cifaretto. This is one of those series that are unfalsifiable though, considering Ralph was murdered shortly after his son passed away at the hands of Tony. In 2021, in a Talking Sopranos episode, it's also worthy to note that Chase adds that, in addition to the horse, the main contributor to Tony murdering Ralph is due to Ralph beating his pregnant girlfriend, Tracy, to death earlier in the show. Something that stuck with Tony, as Tracy comes to mind to Tony a few times after her death. In particular, there is a scene in Tony's kitchen in which he sees Tracy and his daughter, Meadow. I believe Tony draws a comparison due to Meadow beginning to mature as a young woman. Tracy, too, was an extremely young woman, so not sure that Ralph was on the verge of going on a positive streak the rest of his life, considering we can safely assume that A... <sighs> you brought this on yourself with that girl. A. She was a hua. <clears throat> B. We can safely assume that A... He wasn't going to leave his crew, and B, 
he wasn't going to stop using cocaine, and C, if he can kill a horse to make money via an insurance fraud scam. Uh, yeah, in summation, I mean, I don't really think teaching an old dog new tricks applies for Ralphie. Your aunt, the nun, where's your mother? Some GI knocked her up during the war. Russ. Worst thing. I'm not who I am. Dr. Russ Figoli appears in that episode where Carmela hosts a cookout for her father, Hugh. You'll recall this was during the time when Carmela and Tony were dabbling in the divorce. Anyway, Dr. Russ Figoli is seen here, and in addition to other moments in the show, the internet has pieced together a few odd coincidences that point to a familial connection between the two. Most of these coincidences exist in season 4, almost as if the screenwriters wanted to add a hidden subplot to the scene as an easter egg for the hardcore fans. These are the facts. Number 1, a few days prior to Hugh's birthday party, Carmela invites her parents over for dinner. Once Hugh hears that Russ will be in town, he makes a joke about his having crabs during his time with the Navy. Number two, when Polly's mom reveals the truth of her and Polly's relationship as mother and son, his mother relays some cryptic details to who his father is. She doesn't say anything really before Polly storms off in a fit of rage, but she does relate to him that she was knocked up during World War II by a soldier named Russ. Number three, they are the only two characters in the show that suffer from prostate cancer. There is a scene in which Polly's doctor actually asks him over the telephone if he's aware of his father, in particular, also suffered from the cancer. Russ reveals to Hugh at Hugh's cookout party that he had his prostate undergo radiation. So yeah, make up this info what you will. An abandoned subplot, or maybe just a fun connection the showrunners decided to throw in as a harmless nod to the overall world of Sopranos lore. Let me know what you think in the comments. By far the weirdest scene in the show, and potentially any show for that matter, would be in Season 6, Episode 9, The Ride. During Polly's journey on The Sopranos, outside of his normal day job with the crew, there is an underlying subplot to his character that we get glimpses of from the beginning of the show until the end. See, Polly is obsessed with the supernatural and paranormal. He's constantly waking up from nightmares at 3 o'clock in the morning, paranoid with superstitions here and there throughout the show. Anyway... During Season 6, Episode 9, Polly gets into trouble for skimping on the local carnival ride's equipment quality, which results in injuries to several young children. His adoptive mother scolds him for this, in which he retaliates and curses her out, leaving her in tears. This is a source of Polly's anxiety in addition to worrying he is dying internally of prostate cancer. Later that day, he visits the Bing and encounters the Virgin Mary herself. We get about a full second glimpse of her before she vanishes. What always stuck out to me in this moment is that, technically, before Polly looks over to the stage of the Bing, the audience can see her reflection in the mirror. Surely, the purpose of this is to indicate that the Virgin Mary herself actually exists in the Sopranos universe, and that she is not merely some manifestation from Polly's mind. This moment stays with Polly throughout the remainder of the series, as we see a clear shift in his demeanor from this point forward. He also bothers to mention his disturbing encounter with the Virgin Mary to Tony later in the season. I'd like to propose a toast to my family. You're going to have families of your own. And if you're lucky, you'll remember the little moments. The purpose of Don't Stop Believing is actually something that David Chase gets into during one of the Talking Sopranos podcast episodes. Journey has always been a band that he's been really fond of, even though others find them to be kind of a cheesy band. If you watch that final scene in Made in America in the Holston's Diner, the way in which that scene is choreographed with the song, it's kind of self-evident as to why they chose that song as the lyrics really flow well with the tension that's building. Also, the lyrics, you know, hold on to that feeling. Obviously, Carmela and Tony are discussing how Carlo has flipped, and that means that Tony's probably going to be locked up. So those lyrics, you know, um, hold on to that feeling, could represent Tony enjoying perhaps his last nice moment with his family of four um, in the Holston's Diner. But I don't believe that there is a purpose beyond that. But let me know if you know something I don't in the comments. What family? They're here to welcome you. You can't bring business in there. So there's a scene where Christopher, obviously, when he is shot, he comes out of his coma talking about how he didn't go to heaven, but rather hell. 
Polly, who we'll discuss later on, actually may in fact be a real angel. He actually tries to convince Christopher that it wasn't hell, but in fact purgatory, because hell is hot and that's never been disputed by anybody. More often than not, in The Sopranos, subject of hell and purgatory is brought up way more than heaven. I believe the only instance of heaven in The Sopranos, um, again, is kind of discussed when Christopher is in his coma from being shot, but uh, more specifically, it's, it's during the episode Mayhem in season six where we probably can interpret this moment as Tony being at the gates of heaven, in which his cousin Tony Blundetto is sort of like the doorman. And as Tony is right about to walk into the light, he is revived by the voice of his daughter Meadow and wife Carmela. Now, this is really open to one's interpretation, because this all presupposes that Tony wouldn't just burst into flames if he uh, steps foot into heaven. But all jokes aside... We all know that Tony is a strict Catholic. Well, don't, don't forget, I'm a strict Catholic. Go back to New Jersey. Phil, what are you doing? Cooler heads prevailed. Uncle Philly. There's nothing left to discuss, Carmine. This is just a fun throwaway on the iceberg. Phil doesn't actually turn into a house, but once Phil is no longer willing to meet Tony physically due to uh, losing his brother at the hands of Tony Blundetto, Phil is only willing to shout down to street level to speak to little Carmine and Tony. So it looks as if it's the house speaking to Tony and it, it's kind of hilarious, but yeah, there's just a little bit of background on that. The infamous ending of the show's finale, Made in America, caught the world by storm when it aired back in 2007. I think hindsight is 2020 today in a world where we're all very well assimilated with researching things on the internet, but back then it was a different time. As the title of this bit suggests, many speculated that HBO censored the ending of the episode and that the rest of the ending would continue elsewhere off air, either via a follow-up episode or a follow-up movie in theaters. Alas, we know today the ending cut to black was very well intentional. I think we can infer based on many different quotes that yes, Tony did in fact get clipped. I went against his advice, Father. I got hooked up with the wrong people. Sweet Jesus, it really is you. Lilyhammer is a crime comedy drama television series starring Stephen Van Zandt who plays Silvio in The Sopranos, about a former New York-based gangster named Frank, the fixer, Tagliano, who is trying to start a new life in an isolated town in Norway named Lilyhammer. The show ran for three seasons with a total of 24 episodes from 2012 to 2014. While I haven't watched it yet, it seems to be rated sort of favorably on Rotten Tomatoes and features a pretty stacked cast for what it is. Also, the likes of uh, Stephen Van Zandt's wife, who also is his wife in The Sopranos, also appears in the episode, in addition to Tony Sirico, who, of course, plays Polly Walnuts in The Sopranos, these two appear in the show, but are not really characters that belong to the Sopranos universe. Like, you can make the headcanon, but more likely than not, the show really is not trying to make the case that it belongs in the same timeline or universe as The Sopranos, but rather they pay homage to The Sopranos. So there's one scene in which uh, Steve Van Zandt's character is asleep, and there is a man who's sitting beside him in a rocking chair and he's saying, Silvio, it was all a dream. Which you could infer is a reference to Silvio being in his coma, which we see at the end of season six of The Sopranos. But then in a separate scene, Steve Van Zandt's wife in Lilyhammer, which is also his wife in The Sopranos, says this. The return of Frankie the Fixer. This is like a Sopranos episode. And obviously this is a catch-22 where you can't be making references to the show The Sopranos, but at the same time be existing in this coma as Lily Hammer, which is what the iceberg is kind of suggesting here, right? So it's, it's a little silly. And I haven't seen Lily Hammer like front to back, but again, I know it is kind of favorably rated on Rotten Tomatoes, so I will make time for it someday. So definitely let me know in the comments if there's anything I'm missing or if you disagree. Nothing. What is? I've 
Everything's black. This bit is stating the obvious, in my opinion, but let's do a quick rundown of the main characters that appeared in Season 1 and 2 of The Sopranos. At the end of the series, Chrissy, Bobby, Pussy, Ralphie, Richie, and Vito all wind up clipped. Sale is in a deep coma and it doesn't look like he's going to make it out of it. Tony obviously is on the verge of New York delivering his just desserts, and of course, the Sopranos family are about to lose their father. However, worthy to note, outside of the Tony dying part, Meadow and AJ are actually doing pretty great. Meadow is engaged to Patrick, Patsy's educated son, and AJ is about to begin what appears to be a promising career in the film industry and is breaking free from his bout with depression. Carmela spent most of the show in turmoil over her husband, and now I guess she's kind of freed of him. And who knows, maybe Furio reunites with Carmela once Italy catches word of Tony's fate. Did you do it? No. I said no! This series suggests that Polly is the one, in fact, who killed Pai Mai in retaliation to Ralph prank calling his mother. See, Polly always had a beef with Ralphie, so this would serve as the straw that broke the camel's back in hitting Ralphie where it hurts. Me, personally, I don't buy it. And obviously, Chase confirmed it was in fact Ralphie in an episode of the Talking Sopranos podcast, as we discussed earlier. You're late. Well, tomorrow I can be on time. But well, you'll be stupid forever. And then Mikey gave me a message for both of you. A message? Yeah, he said, uh, tell Tony and Paulie, three o'clock. Three o'clock? Three o'clock is the message that Christopher relays to Paulie and Tony, coming out of his coma when he nearly died in season two via gunshot wounds. This is obviously a message that sticks with Paulie, where he wakes up in a cold sweat at 3 a.m. several times, wondering what the message means. As most know in pop culture, 3 o'clock is commonly referred to as the witching or devil's hour. Many horror movies, particularly those which are based in Western Catholicism, such as The Conjuring, often use 3 at night as prime time for the paranormal to torment the natural world. In The Sopranos, 3 o'clock symbolically bears a strong significance in its own right, in addition to the characters on the show proclaiming to be strong Catholics. In the final episode, Made in America, Meadow attempts her parallel park twice before finally getting it right on the third try. When Tony is about to get clipped in the diner, he looks up and we can assume is given a gunshot wound coming from his three o'clock. You know the name Kevin Finity? He drives a Lexus. You know him? It's a joke. Infinity, Lexus. This is an episode in which Tony is in a coma due to his uncle Junior shooting him. In Tony's coma, he lives the life of a man named Kevin Finnerty. Now, this is one of those episodes that are very open to interpretation, but if you ask me, Kevin Finnerty always represented Tony's inner good person, without the stripes he earned as, you know, that fat fucking crook from New Jersey. In all seriousness though, yeah, the good guy he is deep down without the overweighing sin, infidelity, life's taken on his accord, and all around rest that makes Tony Tony. The guy that all of his friends and enemies respect out of fear and hatred. Kevin Finnerty is without these things. You can argue that Tony's subconscious created this persona as a means to fantasize how simple and carefree his life would be if he weren't the byproduct of Johnny Boy and Livia. Through his therapy sessions with Melfi, we see that Tony's outlook on where he's been and where he is going is very much driven by his belief in fatalism. He believes he never had a choice in any of this. Thus, we see the fantasy that is Kevin Finnerty. Anyway, that's been my interpretation of the character. Let me know how you interpret who or where Kevin Finnerty came from and his coma dream in general in the comments below. Purgatory, a little detour run away to paradise. You add up all your mortal sins and multiply that number by 50. Then you add up all your venial sins and multiply that by 25. You add them together, and that's your sentence. There are fan theories that suggest, of course partially tongue-in-cheek, that Pauly is an angel. He has the wings, somehow is able to evade any injuries whatsoever, despite his day job being quite hostile. And every night at midnight they whack him the same way he was whacked in life, and it's painful. Night after night. During the last scene in Holston's when Tony enters the restaurant, he makes a very odd facial remark at seemingly nothing. Then, exactly after that, the scene abruptly cuts to Tony sitting in the booth, almost as if to suggest that Tony is watching himself in the booth. In an earlier scene several seasons back, when Christopher wakes up from his coma, he reports a few experiences back to his crew on what the afterlife is like. He says that hell is something awful happening to you over and over. Given the nature of the abrupt cut, 
I can't rule out the possibility that Tony's hell is, in fact, this moment with his family repeated over and over, in which his family witnesses his head getting blown off at a diner for all of eternity. What the f***? I got him, didn't I? Yeah. <sighs> so the Pine Barrens in New Jersey is essentially pine lands which stretch along as far as seven counties in the state of New Jersey along the Atlantic coast of the United States. It is mostly trees, thus of course a likely area for a folklore such as the Jersey Devil to manifest. The Jersey Devil, for the uninitiated, is an urban legend that describes a creature born of a woman named Jane Leeds, whom, after realizing she was pregnant a 13th time and frustrated about it, cursed her unborn baby, and thus, the baby quickly grew hideous deformities, including a goat's head, bat wings, a forked tail, and hooves. After transforming into the Jersey Devil, the creature proceeds to kill the other 12 children and its mother, then flies away into the Pine Barrens. So flash forward to about two and a half centuries later in 2001, and wouldn't you know, a couple of Goomba douchebags are using the Jersey Devil stomping grounds as a dumping bay for undesirables as, you know, they want to dispose of them. Valerie in this episode, the ex-commando Russian, is able to easily escape from the clutches of Polly and Christopher. We never find out about Valerie's fate. We do know that there was originally written a scene in season 6 in which Polly and Chrissy happen to run into Valerie at a bar by sheer coincidence and proceed to shoot him on sight. Tony Sirico, who plays Polly on the show, said that David Chase made the executive decision not to shoot this scene. Chase has been inundated with questions from fans on Valerie's fate, in which he says, they shot a guy. Who knows where he went? Who cares about some Russian? This is what Hollywood has done to America. Do you have to have closure on every single little thing? Isn't there any mystery in this world? It's a murky world out there. It's a murky life these guys lead. And by the way, I do know where the Russian is, but I'll never say because so many people got so pissy about it. So back to the original theory the iceberg suggests. If I had to make the case for it, I would certainly challenge the show writers on why they chose the Pine Barrens to begin with. After all, the Pine Barrens are notoriously tied to the folklore of the Jersey Devil, which obviously has a large footprint on pop culture in general. Also, the fact that the show writers went out of their way to depict Valerie as a highly capable war vet, then for him to completely disappear for the rest of the show? I don't know. The show already makes quite the effort to tap into the paranormal now and again, so I can't rule out the possibility that they're saying without saying it that someone or perhaps something, got to Valerie. Something that even the ex-commando himself was no match for. During Livia's wake, shortly after we see Bob and Sarah's ghost in the closet mirror, in the background we can make out a man taking a look at the downstairs for a peek, before making his way back upstairs. Since we see Pussy's ghost here, it's safe to say that the area in general feels haunted. This leaves the door open to the man perhaps being the ghost of really anyone. It could be Dickie, Johnny Boy, I've even seen some say a younger junior. Never heard of a ghost appearing of a person who hasn't passed yet? Then of course, despite this being an iceberg video, and the low hanging fruit in each subject is to find its edgy haunted angle, the easier outcome is likely what Sopranos does best in the realm of comedy, where this is likely that it's just some dude who got invited, is hiding upstairs, waiting until the wake is over, and it becomes socially acceptable for him to F off and go home. Let me know what your thoughts are in the comments. And that should do it for the iceberg. I had so much fun rewatching this show probably like five times over while making the video. The Sopranos really is the gift that keeps on giving and it never gets old. So to commemorate the 25 years of The Sopranos, let me know in the comments your favorite episode and or a memory scene or discovery that stands out to you. And if you would like to see more content and want to help support the channel, please consider dropping a like on the video and subscribing for future content. And thank you again for watching. Sometimes I go about in pity for myself. And all the while, a great wind carries me across the sky. Oh, jeeb we say. Indians, right? Who put this up?